What is up, everybody? This is Josh Schiffman here from JS9 Innings Media. This is the third episode of the JS9 Innings Podcast, the official podcast of JS9 Innings Media. Today, we're joined by my co-host, Ian Moore. Ian, say hello to everybody. What's up, guys? It's a pleasure to be back. And we are joined by our guest for this episode, Ian Miller, former Major League Baseball player and the owner of the nine hole podcast. It is a pleasure to have you on Ian. Josh, Ian, thank you boys for having me, man. It's awesome getting to come on here. Um, come on different platforms, different podcasts, Ch talk baseball, dude, chop it up, man. Obviously Josh, we've had a relationship that's been growing over the past, you know, six months or so, whatever that is, man, it's, it's been awesome, dude. It's been awesome to see the progress you've made here uh, and kind of like building out your dream, dude. So it's awesome to be here, bro. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it, and same for you. Uh, I was we were I was very lucky to meet you. Uh, what was it about a month ago? About a month ago. So we met at uh, the Pancake House, great place. That's right, bro. That's but, right, uh, dude. In person. Radio. Yes, sir. That was that was awesome. You're first. You're actually the first uh, ML, MLB player that I've met. So that's that's a big. Won't be the last, bro. <laughs> Won't be the last, especially where you guys are going, man. It's cool to uh, see the success already you guys are having with all this. I really appreciate it. And same with you. You're building up a great brand on your end. So very excited you, to see where that takes you. And you have a lot of connections. So that's, it's really helps you out. So thank you, dude. It means a lot. So uh, for the third episode, we're joined by Ian Miller here. The first episode, it was just me and my co-host Ian Moore. The last episode we had Steven Nelson. Uh, he was, he is a broadcaster for, broadcaster for the Los Angeles Dodgers. So Ian Miller, uh, you played with the Cubs, you played with the Twins, and you were in the minor leagues for the Mariners. Uh, what's it like just being in the major leagues, in the minor leagues? What's it like being a baseball player? Dude, <clears throat> there's, man, that is a very good question. I would say it's a lot different than what I'm experiencing now being out of baseball. So to just kind of unpack it and throw it into a package right there. You lose track of the days. You, you know, you don't know if it's a Wednesday or a Monday. Every day is kind of the same. You have a routine where in the minor leagues you play for six days and then you have off now on Sunday. I think that's what it is for travel and stuff. So like Monday through Saturday, dude, the, the days blend together. Uh, the months blend together. You're unaware if it's July or if it's August. Like you're just living the dream day after day. You have no concept of time. There's nowhere you have to be, bro. You don't have to wake up at a certain time. You don't have to be anywhere at a certain time other than the field before stretch to get your work in. You know what I mean? So how it feels to be a baseball player, it's great, dude. It's fantastic. And when you get to the higher minor leagues and when you get to the major leagues, like it becomes a dream more so than it, than it already is in the minor leagues. But you start realizing it when, you know, you're making paychecks that you've never made before and you're in five-star hotels that like you take pictures of because there's robes and stuff that you can wear dude it's wild you know and and the clubhouses are nuts and dude it's a it's a wild experience bro um so like yeah that was dude it's it's the life bro it's the life well it, it really seems like you really like you really enjoyed being a minor leaguer a major leaguer you you took advantage of it you you didn't take it for granted i feel like they're there are some MLB players right now. Maybe we don't have to name could if we <laughs> want, but who who really they they take so much advantage of it and they're or they really just uh they just they don't like I feel like they don't look at it. It's like, wow, I'm so lucky to do this. I'm so lucky to make uh this amount of money. I mean, like baseball I Baseball to play baseball as your job, like I feel like some players don't take don't take it that seriously, but I'm glad you do. And because for your love for baseball and for your career, you built the nine hole podcast. Yeah, dude. Yeah, dude. It's uh the way that I've been explaining it kind of in my lead up to where I'm at right now is like, dude, me playing in the big leagues and me being uh, you know, a division one bottom of the barrel walk on and having to play my cards right in the recruiting game just to get on campus, like to play the cards right with the scouts and the, you know, visits and getting drafted and maximizing like 
that was all kind of just a stepping stone in getting to creating the nine hole brand, dude. So now it's like, you know, it's a podcast on the surface. You see the social media content. I put out a video, you know, six personalized video that I made, like my content per week, six, seven a week. And like, you know, we've 13 million views since May 6th, you know, uh, almost two months, over 13 million views. Like it's, it's wild, bro. So I feel like everything was kind of like an incremental stepping stone to get to this point, dude. So I appreciate it. You're hundred percent right, dude. You see some type, you sometimes you see players by the way that they handle themselves, they act, they play the game, uh, their enthusiasm and love for it, their interactions. It's like, dude, they take stuff for granted, you know? Yeah, so I was never one of those players, dude. Um, not to cut you off here. My bad. I, I feel like I took every day as a blessing because I knew I'm fortunate to be where I'm at. And like, not saying it's accidental, but I know that like it could be taken away because I know that I'm an average baseball player that just works, you know, has to outwork people and like dudes are getting better as they get older and like it's going to creep up on you. So I, I, did, I didn't take it for granted, bro. I think it's important too, like to see the element of like giving back, right? Like a lot of these players now because of the, the high popularity, not from the sense of like the self game, but really from the sense of like spreading the message of the game all these players are coming out now and they're wanting to do things like podcasts. They're wanting to have giveaways. They're wanting to have meet and greets. They're really trying to like get out there, assimilate themselves into the fan base more. And, you know, you see there was once a time, I feel like probably about not too far along ago, but basically it was when the pandemic first hit and major league baseball really didn't have like a showcase player. I mean, Mike Trout for years really is like the unanimous like face of the league or has been, so to speak the same way, like, you know, guys like Brady and Manning were for the NFL and, you know, Trout very honestly just kind of said, like, I don't want to be put on that pedestal. Like I'm not really looking to like be that guy, even though I'm like, you know, a good hero figure for a lot of young kids. It's not really why I'm here. Like I just want to play ball. And like, now I feel like you got a lot of these younger guys who are coming up. They're starting to really embody the real like message and image of the league. And like, for you to kind of just openly admit, like, you know, you're back here to, contribute to the baseball fandom community and you want to like give your part like that's very commendable in my opinion because baseball for years has really struggled in terms of its popularity spreading there's a lot of like great american sports that are out there but there's only one american national pastime sport right that's baseball Amen. and it's always been that way and like i'm an nfl lover and i'm an mlb lover too but like my first love was baseball my dad played baseball he came up through the expos and unlike yourself like farm system was pretty rough like the hotels and everything pretty low star low quality low pay overall and i think that's just from the standpoint of like new franchise coming into the league didn't really have much to offer in that regard wasn't really willing to pay the players a whole lot so what you talk about now and what the game really was and what it's become complete transformation and in, in my opinion the total positive direction 100 percent, bro 100 percent. it's cool like at least you see now with social media and the age that everything, like all the information and everything can spread to everybody's fingertips at the blink of an eye. Right. So like some people can act a fool and ruin their brand or their reputation or come off the wrong way. Right. Or some people can use that to spread positivity and like have an impact. And like, I needed to focus all of my energy on literally just trying to hit above 250 and stay afloat in the high minor leagues. And like, you know, the big leagues and stuff. And like, dude, that was, that was damn near impossible. It's hard, bro. I didn't even have time to focus on my energy, like, you know, trying to do all the other stuff. So like, I had this idea of the nine hole and stuff and trying to give back and like do a positive, have a positive impact on the next generation and stuff, especially the player that I used to be the one that needed guidance and like would, you know, was an underdog and didn't have a full ride. And, you know, and I wasn't six, five and through a hundred, like, I, I, I don't know. Obviously I have more time to be able to to focus and do it now, but I feel like I I'll have way more impact with this than I ever had on the baseball field, you know? No, for, for sure. And um, Ian go or Ian Moore, cause we have two Ian's here, Ian, what you were saying before with your dad, I was going to say, you could probably relate to this more than me because you, you played baseball a little more than I did. Your dad was in the, in the minor leagues with, with the Expos. I mean, your dad, uh, Mr. Moore, the goat, by the way, has, uh, I mean, he's always, he loves the game of baseball. When every time I've been around you two, it's, it's always baseball. We're always, we're in the same fantasy baseball league with, with my dad too. Like your dad 
clearly, I would say clearly cares about the game because he taught it to you. Uh, I mean, my friendship with your dad, I mean, a lot of it's because we love baseball. We're also yeah, great I family friends, but we, we talk baseball all the time. Your dad sent me, uh, uh, your dad sent me, uh, of, of something about Bobby Bonilla today to, oh. to me and my dad. Is, so uh, is today Bobby Bonilla day? It yeah, is July 1st. Happy oh, Bob wow. Bobby Bonilla day to everyone Bless who up. celebrates. There's not many more left, right? No, no I think he's like, like 10 more years left, 11 more. Oh, is sure, Canseco sure. Still yeah. Is Jose Canseco's contract still floating around? <laughs> I'm not sure, but I know Griffey, Ken Griffey Jr. got paid today. Chris Davis got paid today. Ryan oh, Braun. Wow. You got a lot of guys. That's it's awesome, cool. brother. Yeah. <laughs> Casually Man. getting a mill <laughs> when you're not playing. That's crazy, dude. Yeah, Soon to be wild. O'Connell. Or when he retires, but crazy. Yeah. But yeah, no, but. I mean, I think this just shows that baseball is – it has a bigger impact than I think people realize. For it, me, it was, it was a sport that was able to be passed down, you know? Like, I'll definitely want to teach my kids baseball someday, like, boy or girl, I don't really care. And, like, you know, just kind of, like, looking back on my life, like, my dad was really that figure for me who, like, got me out on the diamond. We would go out there after school when I was in elementary and, like, we would just hit, you just throw me BP until his shoulder wore out literally. And like, you know, even, even when it wasn't like that and we were working on fundamentals, it was hitting off the tee, making sure like you got a clean ground stroke on the ball, like bats, the barrel, clean contact, that type of stuff, like always willing to put in that extra bit of work after his day of work was over with. And, you know, I think that as we look now from what baseball is now, involving the youth all the way through every step of the line is like the big thing. I remember back when I did the Cal Ripken Academy that I was invited for in Aberdeen, Maryland, back when I played, I think that was from the age of like 10 to 12 or something like that. I was playing with a lot of 14 and 15 year olds just because that was like the nature of the beast. And, you know, Billy Ripken and Cal Ripken were out there themselves. This wasn't something that they had like people paid for and everything like that. They were out there. They were given the hitting practice, the drills, the instruction, just being able to kind of sit around them and be in that circle and watch and just like really take it all in. I think that now as players are exiting the major leagues, giving that impact through not really like charity work mostly, but just simply like putting on clinics and getting people together for different kinds of programs and spaces where they can, you know, really just drill in. There's nothing more impressionable than like a young mind looking to a former athlete, in my opinion. And like, that's one of the big connecting points. And like, Ian, I'm sure that you've spoken to your fair share of people who either, whether it's through a local town municipality or you're going back to, like coach a high school team or maybe it's a middle school team or a t-ball team, whatever it is. I mean, I'm sure there's people who look at you with like eyes wide open kind of start in effect and you're able to get right through. For sure. I, I mean, obviously like, you know, that, that adds to the credibility of what I'm trying to do. Right. I, I know that even though I got like three hits and 16 at bats in the big leagues, right. Just the fact that I was there, I understand it adds credibility to whatever room that I go in when I'm when I'm talking about baseball or instruction. And dude, like Josh, you know me. I dude, I I don't I don't say I can't give a better hitting lesson than the dude down at extra innings down the street, right? Or like the dude at the local, you know that that didn't play past high school but studies this, you know, day in and day out. That guy probably knows a better hitting swing than me, right? But like I don't say that I'm a, a I'm an expert, right? I just I'm trying to share my opinions on like. Not even opinions, dude, like my experiences, like my insight, what happened to me, what worked for me, what could probably work for those guys. And then I have other people on throughout their walks of life in the game, whether they're like major league coaches, top 25 college coaches, major league players, retired players. Like I have them on and I just talk, you know what I mean? There's there's a story there for everybody. So, dude, I love it, man. I, 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 I couldn't agree more with what you guys are saying. It's cool seeing the impact that the players have today on the next generation and how they're like molding it. You know what I mean? It's awesome to see. Uh, my next question. So Ian, what you were saying before about you, just your dad throwing to you and all that, obviously during lockdown, we were playing baseball, like what, four or five times. Oh yeah. Every yeah. single day after work. And, and uh, your dad was throwing to us every day. And my, so this is where my next question falls. So Ian Miller, 
I know you were you were on the Twins in 2019, and yep. then you were you made the Cubs uh, spring training in in 2020, right? Yep, yep. So it got shut down a week before like spring training ended. So how I, I want to ask how did that uh, the shutdown of baseball? How did that impact your uh, baseball career? And oh, just dude, your just your baseball life, I should say. I mean, the the lockdown and the shutting down every I mean, dude, it had a huge impact on me, on my career. I was 28 years old, like in the prime of my career. So I I had just signed. um, What was it? Yeah, 2020. I just signed my first minor league spring, like my minor league free agent contract where I was making money for the first time. So I'm 27. I mean, I'm going to be 28 years old, right? 27. I was just in the big leagues. 28 uh 2020 i'm just about to like start making money as a minor league free agent like i'm gonna be with the cubs i had a great spring training and then it shuts down a week before like spring training ends dude i was in a fantastic position jason kipnis and myself were the last two non-roster invitees in spring training dude i thought i was going to break with the cubs out of spring training i would it was jason kipnis and, and myself as the last two dudes uh i was making plans Like we were making, my wife and I were making plans, like everything was pointing to that and then it shut down. Right. And so I'm 28 years old. This is obviously like a, a big time year for me while where I'm in my prime. I just established myself as a a major leaguer the year prior, right? Like I didn't establish myself, but I proved that I could get there. I could, I proved I could hold my own. And then I miss out on a year of development. Right. So like we talk about paycheck. Um, so I was set to make like money for the first time throughout a year and, you know, that that obviously gets cut two thirds, just taken out with the yeah. pay. Everybody took a hit, dude. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying like that affected me there. I lost about two thirds of a season of development. Right. So like I would go to the alternate site, dude, um, you know, when it opened back up and I would try to, you know, emulate getting reps in there, dude. But it it's not the same as like running out there and playing 140 games, even if you played 50 games. You know what I mean? So oh, for sure. um, it affected me big time obviously as everything was still going on and everything was shut down, dude, I had to work out my wife and I, at, we lived at the time in like a, I don't even think it was a 600 square foot, tiny, like apartment in, in right near the Cubs spring training complex. And so like we were shut down there and locked in there for, you know, six months. And so yeah. I would do workouts and stuff out of there when I couldn't go to the field with like gear that I got from the field. So I would have like dumbbells and do full workouts in a 600 square foot apartment with my wife, dude. So that's how it was for us, dude. Obviously like it had an impact on my career. I lost out on putting up numbers, right? I'm a little speed guy that, that does well with defensive metrics, stolen bases, uh, you know, run production on the base. You know, that's how I derive value. That's how a player like me has about, va- and dude, I didn't have any of that. I missed out on a year of that. I'm in my prime. I'm 28. You know, if I can, if I can steal 50 bags and run a six to 60 yard dash, like when I'm 28 years old, I'm in my prime. So I can do that at, at the highest level possible. So I missed out on a year of that, you know, there were a whole lot of people that ended up way worse than me. So like, there's no complaining, but yeah, you know, it definitely did impacted the wallet, yeah. impacted the opportunity, but we kept rolling and we went into 2021 with, you know, what we have. You you played a game though with with the Cubs that year, right? During the short yeah. Season, right? So I got so what happened was, honestly, this is what happened. I had a, an out in my contract, so the Cubs had to call me up before I believe it was like August first. So there was an out in my contract. There's an opt out. It's called, and so I had the power where it's like, hey, I feel like I'm not getting opportunity here. I'm going to opt out, and I'm going to be a free agent, and like. I thought at the time I had a pretty solid uh, case for that. Like if I hit the free agent market, there's going to be a playoff team that needs like a, a a backup guy, right? Like if Byron Buxton got hurt and he can't steal the bag in the, in the postseason, maybe Ian Miller could do it, right? That's what the twins had me over there for. So I had an opt out in my contract and they called me up right before my opt out. And so they called me up for, I think it was like, I was up there for two or three days and then they DFA'd me. So like I wow. couldn't do my opt out. And it was strategic where they knew that I would be retained because like a roster was already set. So like it was the the stuff behind the scenes is crazy, right? I'm fortunate. Uh, I was up there for, yeah, a couple of days. Only got to be in there for a game though in a Cubs uni. 
That puts a big perspective in the front office, obviously. I mean, with what they're up to. It's a lot of stuff that, like, we don't really see from the fan perspective. Dude, dude, yes. Like, yes. It is a freaking chess match (laughs) behind closed doors. And so, like, like, let's think about this. So there are only 40 roster spots, right? And I don't even know the rules now. I don't know if the roster is 26 or 28. Like, I don't even know what the rules are. I feel like they're changing. So, like, let's say it, let's just say it's 26. In order for me in double A to get called up to triple A, somebody at the big league level needs to go down or gets traded or gets axed. Somebody in triple A either fills his spot or he's axed to make way for you or their side. Like, it's, it's a pet, like there, there's a ripple effect. And in order yeah. for somebody to move up, like incremental pieces need to also reciprocate movement. That's a totally nerdy way of saying it, but that's just, you know, that's the way it comes out. But yeah, dude, it, it's a chess match. It's crazy, bro. It's crazy what they're doing behind the scenes. Can I, can I ask how, like, like, like when they tell you, or when they, when you got DFA, like, how does that work? Do they call you into like, does the manager call you into the office office and say like, or his office and say like, like sorry to tell you like you just, you just got like designated for your assignment or like how do, how does no. that work? no dude no if you would think right you would think and they they would do that with like the veteran dudes right oh, but I a guy like way worse so oh. dude a guy like me dude i find out about it so so this is how i found out with the with the twins bro is the off season and i got a call from my agent around like halloween dude 2019 Halloween, like, yo, how's everything going? Like, I hope the family's good. You got DFA by the twins, bro. So, like, now it's this three to five day gray period. I don't know what it's called. You're on waivers. If no one picks you up, doesn't seem like anybody will pick you up. We'll go through the free agent process. I didn't get, I didn't even get a text message from somebody from the twins, dude. They didn't even let me know, bro. I found That's out terrible. from my agent and then I read about it on Twitter. And so, like, with the Cubs, they brought me up. I was there for two or three days and they're like, Hey dude, we're going to, thanks for coming up. We're going to send you down. We're going to send you down. Uh, the manager doesn't know at the time, right? He doesn't call the shots, dude. So the manager doesn't have say. Wait, so who's, who's pulling the strings then when it comes to that? It's, dude, it's, it's the GM. It's the okay. GM. The manager has no input. Obviously a respected manager. Yeah. With, like a Bruce Bochy would be able to say, you know, like, Hey, I've been here for 50 years, bro. I've been in the league for 50 years. I know a good baseball player. This guy can impact my team and the front office might listen to him. Right. But, um, you know, a first time manager like David Ross, maybe in the Cubs in 2020, I don't know if Rossi's got that kind of pool, at least not. That's not what I saw. You know what I mean? Like they they have, it was Jed Hoyer and dude, it was crazy. I'm surprised that, uh, they don't inform David Ross. And then I would, I would just think that, he would call you into his office and then lay the news. That's terrible. I would, I would, if I was a major league baseball player or any athlete and I find out about my future or what's happening to my career on Twitter, that's like, that's scary. Yeah, dude, you're a piece of meat. So you're a piece of meat, dude. Like they don't have loyalty to you, bro. They don't owe me shit. Sorry for cursing, but they don't no, owe me. Shit. They don't owe me shit. So no they don't care. Here. They don't care, dude. They don't care. They'll let me know. Either I'll find out about it on Twitter or my agent will tell me. They don't care. They're not going to bat an eye on it, and it's not a knock against them, dude. But here's also the flip. Here's the flip. So this is why even if, like, Rossi knew, he can't tell me. Or, like, you got to be very secretive with the roster plan. So if I'm in AAA and I get told that I'm getting called up, that means that there needs to be a subsequent roster move up at the big league level. So somebody on that 26-man roster, if they catch word from me in AAA that there's movement coming up to the big league roster, that means that somebody's on the chopping block up top. And so the intermediaries, right, the coaching staffs, the front office, they try to have a like a fucking – I'm cursing again, sorry – a block <laughs> in good. between the two so information doesn't get spilled because the 26th man up there who has an inkling that he's the one that's going to get sent down after the game – He's going to fake a hamstring injury and then he's going to go on the 60 day DL and he's going to be making paychecks and getting service time. So wow. they try to be extremely bro. They try to be extremely secretive. So they don't want you to know. So it's like, Hey Ian, you're going, you're getting sent down. Uh, we're going to send you back to the alternate site in South bend. Meanwhile, bro, 
I was technically on paper already DFA'd like 12 hours earlier, but they didn't like, no one knows. You know what I mean? Wow. That's front office stuff. It, they're not going to let me know because then yeah, I'm going to tell somebody I, they don't want that. And it's like a whole shuffling of roster stuff. So, dude, they're very secretive with it. That's, That's pretty crazy in all honesty. People, dude, we're talking about tens of thousands of dollars a day that people could, like, you know, screw the organization out of by faking an injury, knowing that there's a subsequent move coming. And they're like, hey, dude, I think I'm on the chopping block. My back hurts. My back hurts. I can't pitch. And now, like, I got to go on the DL. It's so they, they do. They try to protect that. I mean, and without without calling out like specific players, like uh, you've seen <laughs> that, right? Yeah, absolutely, That's crazy. absolutely. I've actually seen, I've actually seen a manager let a player know that the chopping block was coming to prolong and slash or fake an injury so i'm not going to give insight into anything but i've seen it firsthand of a manager who was regarded as having the players back like that that earns respect among a minor league player right let's say we're in the minor leagues and let's say this player needs a paycheck and he's he needs that paycheck he's older it doesn't look like baseball is going to be in his future next year well that manager might have the look him out, look like look out for him and tell him to prolong an injury, like whatever the case, or if he's gonna get traded to a worse, like whatever it is. I've seen I've seen that happen before, where players have faked an injury. Uh, I've also seen players trying to prolong an injury in order to remain employed, remain on the team, and I've seen a coach and I've seen a player cross swords and make an injury happen in order to prolong a career, and like. I'm not knocking on it, dude, because what's what's an extra 10, 15, 20 grand to to, you know, the Colorado Rockies if that's if that's what the team that's nothing to them, dude. You know, but it could be everything to a player. There's it's a double edged sword, dude, you know, because it's not right. But yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, I mean, that makes me really think about like you said 2019 twins. I'm like going back in my memory and I'm like thinking about every single guy that like maybe threw himself on the 60 day IL with like rotator cuff soreness or tendonitis. And like, there's no timetable for return, so to speak. Like that's kind of like where you've got my mind thinking now, like, Hmm, like yeah. I wonder. Yeah. Cause like, I mean, season ending surgery is season ending surgery. Like I'm not going to go out there and widely criticize anybody for like, you know, BS and that around, but like, stuff where I definitely see people go under for like no timetable for return or like no set metric with it, or they take their sweet time and like the rehab portion. I'm like, mm, I get what you mean. Yeah, dude. It's there really is that man. Cause we're talking about like potentially life changing money on the line. So like people do some, people do some stuff when, when they're able to get away with it. Yeah. I don't think I, I don't, I don't think I ever realized how much of a how much of an effect that has on other players. Like obviously players fake injuries. There was a poll by the Athletic that said or that had players answer truth truthfully if they uh if they knew someone was doing that. I think 70 or 60% said yes. Yeah, nice reference Maybe it was I saw more. That the other day. Too. Really? That yes. high? Yeah, that high. It, Dude, I don't that's... know if it was more or less, but it was somewhere around there. And oh and like I like I read that. I was like, all right, but I don't I didn't I never understood the impact it has on other players on that team, whether it's the major leagues, the 25th guy on the roster, 26, the the triple A minor leagues, all of that. That has a huge impact and it trickles all the way down through the organization. Yes, dude. It, they they say like a lot of luck goes into you making it to the big leagues. Like I counted my blessings all the time. I know that I was extremely fortunate. The stars literally had to align for me to get a path. Like I went up in September for the Minnesota Twins because Byron Buxton had a banged up shoulder. And there were questions about him being able to dive headfirst into second base or lay out as a defensive replacement in center field. Like that's why that's the only reason why I was there, bro. I had a stellar year 
right? I hit like 260, 270 with, you know, 11 or 12 home runs in AAA and stole 30. So we're like, I had a good year, whatever it was. And like, I still had to get extremely lucky in order to get a chance elsewhere from my own organization. You know what I mean? So the stars definitely align and everything that happens has a trickle down effect impact on opportunity, on spots, on, you know, likelihood of getting a promo, like anything, dude. And it all starts from the top. So like from double A up, dude, they can manipulate the high A rosters and down. So like if somebody gets sent down from the big leagues to triple A, it won't affect from high A down but it'll affect from triple A and double A. You know what I mean? Like oh, yeah. that oh, has yeah. a direct impact on the high minor leagues for sure, bro. That's crazy. And you brought up when before, when you were with the twins, when you made your debut, uh, take me through your first hit. What, what's going through your mind and all that? It was uh, your first hit was off of Jordan Zimmerman, right? Mm-hmm. Mm. Dude. So I was a re like a defensive replacement, right? So I'm, I'm up there in games that matter. So the twins are trying to like gain that wild card spot. So they're still like in the hunt and they locked it in. And so like I was beating you sparingly, dude. So these games, they need to win. I'm a dude on a new team in the big leagues for the first time in the last month of the season when the games count the most. So like they're going to put me in when they really, really need me to be in there. Right. Not in like situations that matter, but like, hey, we're up by two runs. You're a good defensive replacement. Maybe you can take Eddie Rosario out of left field and like go play center. You know what I mean? Like that's the stuff that I would do. Um, dude, so when I would get ABs, I probably had, you know, I don't even remember how many at bats I had where I'm just facing bullpen dudes, throwing a hundred with bangers, and you know, we're winning by a couple runs or we're getting smacked, like whatever it was. That's when I would get in. And so we clinched. So like they we were going to the wild card game, and uh, it was a hundred percent. And then Rocco was like, "Hey, Ian, you're gonna start tomorrow." And I knew like I'm gonna get a I'm gonna get a freaking knock, dude. Because like coming off the bench is tough. Coming off the bench in the big leagues and performing, what, dude? No chance, bro. Coming off the, coming on, off like the... coming off in a clutch moment where you're like literally needed to dude that is so hard you know i have such a respect D dude i have such a respect for that like that to, to be a like try to be in the game and like be aware and root for your guys and then be warm enough to get in there and make an impact is so hard dude so like a design pinch hitter oh dude in a big spot dude what and you've been sitting the whole game and it's cold you know what i mean what yeah and so, like, dude, I got the start, and I knew, man, I was going to get a hit. I knew it. Uh, I knew it, dude. I think I was leading off, which is so sick. Like, <laughs> yeah, I was leading off. It was so sick, man. Uh, my first AB, I didn't get the knock. Second AB, I came up, and, like, I did get the knock for sure. Jordan Zimmerman, man, man on second base. I got that base hit up the middle, ground ball up the middle. And, dude, I was thinking two off the bat. And it, <laughs> the, dude, I was running, and you can see from the replay of my first hit that there's a huge divot. I was making a like a banana turn to go. It was a slow ground ball to center field, and the center fielder was playing back. And, dude, I was running. I was going to go take second. I was going to try to take second in his face, and my foot gave out. You can see it like when it, when it pans and says, oh, Ian Miller just got his first hit. You can see like the divot in the grass. I was going too. It would have been so sick, but like – yeah, the first hit was awesome. RBI, man, it was awesome, bro. I uh, it's something I, dude, I'll never forget. That's awesome. That's that's amazing. Thank you, dude. Appreciate that, man. I want to ask because uh, you I when you when you were in the majors, you played with all these guys on the Twins. You were playing with Buxton. You were playing with Eddie Rosario, other names on the Cubs. You you were in the same locker room as as Anthony Rizzo, Javi Baez, Chris Bryant. I want to ask, and and in the minors, did you did you play with uh J Rod on the Mariners? Yeah, dude. We, I mean, we were like he was in spring training when I was in spring training. He was always way younger than me, so it's not like we were necessarily working in in the same you know groups all the time. But dude, I I shared a field, shared a locker room with J Rod. Man, he's an absolute stud, man, absolute star. Nelson Cruz was over there with the Cubs, or the, excuse oh, me, Nelson. the Mariners when I was over there, dude. Nelson Cruz was also with the twins when I was over there. So that was a connection I had when I got to uh, Minnesota for the first time, Nelson Cruz was one of the first dudes to greet me, man. So that was awesome, bro. Um, yeah, it's crazy.
big yeah, names all around. He had some good years with the Twins. He was the boomstick for quite a bit. Yeah. Dude, he uh, they have a sleep room. They have a nap room in there when I was there for Nelson Cruz because he <laughs> would get there. This is this is not me trying to be like funny or like make a joke. Like, dude, he was there. I was a rookie, right? So I would always try to be there before anybody else because, like, dude, major league clubhouses, like, it's it's literally like a mecca, dude. You go in there and you can just get lost and you're in the best place in the world, right? I would want to get there and soak up and have the coaches see me be the first guy there, right? But, like, I get there an hour before everybody else and Nelson Cruz is already, like, getting done his second workout, dude. And there's a nap room in Target Field. So, like, Nelson could get there super early and, like, get more work in than everybody else. And you're like, dude, this guy's, you know, 40, 41, 42 at the time, and he's still putting out this offensive production. It's no secret. He's just literally putting in more work than everybody else behind the scenes. And nobody knows it. Like, nobody talks about it. But, like, that's what Nelson Cruz is like. It explains why he, he hit close to almost 500 home runs in his career. Yeah. Dude, almost. I saw it at the Mariners. I saw it like firsthand at the Mariners and I saw it firsthand on the same team as that dude in Minnesota. Like that guy's an absolute workhorse takes everything serious. And like, he is a genuine human being, bro, but he gets after it. That's great. Who, uh, who, uh, now who's in the major leagues, who did you like, who are you really good? Like friends with or really good teammates with who's like now on a major league team, dude. So I loved, I loved my time with Emilio Pagan, who was, you know, bullpen piece with the Reds. Um, dude, he was my roommate multiple years, multiple years coming up through the minor leagues. Um, he's absolutely nasty. I think, you know, he's got a two year, 16 or 18 million deal with the uh, with the Reds. Um, Tyler O'Neill was my roommate with the Red Sox, dude. Wow. He, was, he was my roommate for a year or two. I double A, um, you know, I play I play video games with. Schwarber, Almora, those dudes still talk to him, man. Still talk to him, dude. So, um, you know, aside from that, dude, it's 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 tough to maintain those relationships when you're not in the locker room with them, right? So it's like, okay, I can I can text Schwarber about video games. Hey, you're gonna be on, you know what I mean? Or you know, hey, what's going on? How you doing? It's it's tough when you're not teammates with them anymore. You know what I mean? So it's 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 great still trying to like stay in contact with those guys but dude you miss those relationships in the locker rooms bro cuz that's where you know you form those relationships very true but now now you're creating more relationships in a different way through social For sure. media yeah dude the podcast I'm able to prolong strengthen form new relationships dude it's it's got me back into the game man so like just when i thought i was out they pull me back in, bro. So it I'm back in the like baseball. You might have a new opportunity too when it comes to uh, potentially maybe some streaming is what I'm kind of hearing if you're getting online with the boys and getting rowdy. So that is <laughs> something that I brought to No Filter and they turned it down. Oh, they turned man. It down. They didn't like the idea, but you know what? I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway. Dude, you're, you're, do it anyway. you're good at COD. I, I remember seeing some oh, pilots. Yeah. Josh. Oh, oh Josh. Dude, I am. Fucking nasty at COD, <laughs> brother. I am nasty at COD, dude. I'm nasty for sure. And dude, I'm, and dude, yeah, it is what it is. Dude, Ian and I in Black Ops 2. Oh my God. That is like my favorite game of all time. I'm yes, not even joking. Dude. We were so my dirty at that game. Let's go. Let's go. So Let's dirty. go. We still, dude, I still play. I still play. I'm 32 years old. I still, dude, I still log in with my boys that I've been playing since high school. And we still have the same clan tag. You know what I mean? Like, we're still nerds like that, bro. We're all, like, we're all in different states and different parts of the world, dude. It <laughs> is what it is. Great times. Great times. Oh, video games then were great. 100%. I miss that. It's, it'll never be the same. Literally never be the same. It's always the worst feeling when they eventually shut off the servers, too, when you know a game's been, like, minted, like an absolute all-time classic. And then you just can't hit it up anymore in the same way. And you got to go through either like the bots or like the local lobby. It's tough. Breaks my heart. Yeah. That's terrible. Breaks my heart. And we were, we were talking about your first hit before. Um, what, what did you do with that ball? Dude, so I, I donated that. I gave that to the Boys and Girls Club of Lancaster. Um, so... Dude, you know, long story short, my grandfather has had a great relationship with the Boys and Girls Club, obviously from 
way back in the day, dude, my grandfather, my grandmother, dude, they would, they would help out kind of spend time with the, the younger children, whether they're, you know, underprivileged or, you know, might not have the same opportunities as everybody else, uh, come from different backgrounds, different homes, different obstacles. They would, they would, you know, tutor them, spend time with them. And so, yeah. you know, now there was, uh, you know, my grandfather had helped out in, in their journey to build like a multi-purpose kind of turf facility. And so Roberto Clemente field is there. It is like, it's a, it's a baseball field. And so, um, you know, there is a, there's a dugout there dedicated and like, it's got my name up on it, man. Um, you know, my grandfather has helped out there. And so I wanted to remain kind of like faithful and true to that message. And obviously like carry on that legacy and then like do good for good people, try to be like a guiding light. So I donated and gave my first hit ball to the boys and girls club of Lancaster. So like, I wanted to have that as like, dude, I did it, man doesn't matter what odds you got doesn't matter what your background is like i if i did it you can do it so i wanted to have that there as kind of like a you know just just like a a reminder every time like somebody's going through something like hey dude i did it you can do it yeah not everyone could say that you got a a, a, a hit in major league baseball not everyone, for sure i can't do can't. i i appreciate that and so like what good would it do if I just had it framed, like hanging here, right. If it can help somebody like it does, it does better there. If it can send like a positive message and maybe be like, you know, inspiration, dude, I, that's what I'm, that's what I'm aiming to do, man. I'm just trying to like benefit, you know? And just for everybody out there at home, this is what uh, Ian's referencing particularly. Um, so obviously, you know, go spread the love. That's right, dude. That's right. Boys and girls club of Lancaster, man. Appreciate you pulling that up, man. They, uh, they do good stuff, man. They do good stuff for good people and, and kind of, you know, give give children the opportunities maybe that they didn't have if they didn't have the Boys and Girls Club. Teach them good things. So, I mean, I'm curious for my own sake of like trying to get through with a little bit of the relatability, you know, what was your upbringing like as far as baseball was concerned and kind of like how did you eventually scrap your way all the way through the pros? Dude, so, I mean, I was brought up in baseball. My old man played for two years in the Reds farm system. So okay. he was a walk on at UCLA. So that walk on spirit, like I walked on at Wagner college, we connected there. My dad ended up passing away my freshman year of college, like just sorry, randomly, yeah, sorry, right? Just that. out of the blue. I appreciate it, fellas. It's all good. So I just made the team go home for like, you know, we're about to wrap up for Thanksgiving and we get a call that he passed away and it was crazy just like out of the blue, man, I was hitting, I was at the batting cage with him a week before he was, he had it on, you know, 90 mile an hour, the high, the high speed, just turning it back up through the middle. Like it's crazy how life works out. So, um, dude got tried a little bit, like with some, you know, trials and tribulations had to overcome them, bro. Build on kind of like the resilience and kind of just like the grit, like, Hey, never give up whatever kind of BS life throws at you. So, like that was my, that was kind of how everything started for me. Uh, learned everything from, you know, my parents and stuff. And dude, grinding through the minor leagues was kind of, it's, that's a different burden too. That's a different beast, bro. But I feel like I had, uh, you know, the roots and the structure planted just from the adversities in college and stuff, bro. That was, that was kind of my upbringing in the game. So, I mean, obviously besides your dad, who like was without a doubt, your, you know, childhood idol, like who would you really say was your, you know, like, for example, for me, back when I was a kid and I was looking into, and this is going to irk Josh to no end, but like I was a utils guy. So kind of like the thing I would tell people who my player type was like, was I was a lot like Ben Zobris. Like I played all yeah. the positions. I could hit anywhere in the lineup, like whatever the coaches kind of needed. But Very true. My, my idol growing up was Tim Lincecum because Tim Lincecum was a freak of nature the freak i mean two straight cy youngs his third year after the second cy young was like pretty damn good too and he was an excellent pitcher like showcase winning you know for the world series with giants and everything like that but like point being is um you know who was that guy for you when you were coming up dude that guy for me was ichiro oh so, love it love it that's love a great it. so 2020 that's a great 2001 it's his first year over here. And like, I think that's, I was born in 92, right? So like 
nine years old is when I get to kind of lay eyes and get gain the buzz about Ichiro. And dude, I was a little pipsqueak back then. So seeing Ichiro <laughs> play the pipsqueak like small ball, right? Like you call it what it is. I shared a locker room with that guy. I know that that guy's not six four and two hundred and thirty pounds. So like I, you know, I call it like I see it. The small ball watching that guy. That made me fall in love with like the small ball prototype. I think that's probably how the nine hole was born in my mind, dude. So I saw a dude like that do it and do it gracefully and masterfully and beautifully, bro. It's like a freaking art watching that guy swing. You know what I mean? And like doing his, you know, getting ready and laying a bunt down and then like throwing 116 miles an hour from the outfield, dude. It's <laughs> And then being able to be in the locker room with that dude. I got drafted by the Mariners and now I'm in spring training sharing a, I'm sure in a locker room with the dude that I grew up idling. And then I get to meet and talk to this guy. You know, he's giving me bunting advice. I, yeah, dude, it's it's absolutely wild. So Ichiro was definitely that guy for me. Made me fall in love with like that profile of player. And then I tried to be like him. I tried to emulate him. And then I ended up getting to like play with him. I got, you know, I it's crazy, bro. Josh, I mean, I know that guy for used Kershaw, but maybe tell the viewers at home a little bit of why. Yeah, well, my dad growing up, uh, he loves Sandy Koufax. Uh, Kershaw is very, very similar to Koufax. Both lefties, they're both Hall of Famers, both just great pictures, even better people, great role models, especially for myself. So, I mean, I would love to meet Kershaw one day. I have a trillion questions to ask him, but um, I watched this guy. I watch his, I watch every start of his, uh, I fell in love with baseball, obviously because of my dad for his love with, with the Dodgers and just baseball in general. But when I would watch the Dodgers, the one guy I would focus on is Clayton Kershaw. Love that. He was, he was, he was great at the great at baseball. He was great at what he did. He always perfect. He was perfection at what he did. But it was how he carried himself. It he wasn't arrogant. He wasn't a piece of shit. He was he was genuinely a good person, and it's and it's shown by what he does with charity, Kershaw's challenge, all that stuff. So that's why I respect him a lot. And he's gonna be in in the Hall of Fame. I'll be at his Hall of Fame induction when he and after he retires and five or. After he retires five years after that in his Hall of Fame induction, I'll be there. I'll be support supporting him. I'm his number one supporter. So, yeah, I, I love Kershaw. Big guy. Yeah, awesome. I always like to say that, like, you know, the best people that were the players of the game are the ones who, when you're a small kid and you're at the stadium and you are watching the game, either it's batting practice before, maybe it's after the game, you hang your – ball over the railing or maybe it's a hat or it's a glove or it's something and the players will come around and sign it and I feel like without a doubt both of the guys who you just mentioned were those they were those guys and I mean Kershaw still obviously and Josh you're so full of it you go I have a million questions or a trillion questions you said uh, that I would ask Kershaw I already know the first one you would which is how did it feel when you finally won the world series right. after all that time I know you too well by this point but right. you know just it's the like, player, one of those things. just the player fan interaction is what I love. And I'll bring up what, what happened almost a month ago. Ian and I went to uh, the Yankees twins game and Aaron judge threw me a ball. He launched yep. it into the second deck. I caught it. Ian held, uh, I almost lost my balance because there were like 10 other people going for it, but Ian held me up and I caught it. Dude. Uh, and, and judge pointed at me. He's like, he's like, dude, nice catch. I was like, yeah, he pointed at wow. him. He gave him the whole nod of the cap and everything. It was a big moment, um, you know, obviously coming from, like, the captain and all. But, but Josh basically made some acrobatic catch where I was, like, holding on to his shirt collar <laughs> from his right shoulder. And he snagged yeah. that ball. And, I mean, even Verdugo, like, turned around, like, oh, damn, like, nice catch. Yeah. And I'm not, I, like, awesome. I, I'm not, like, the tallest guy either. I, I feel like I'm looking up at everybody. I had my hands up well before everyone else, so that ball was going to me. But I don't know how I caught it because there were like ten people, and literally like Matt, or one of one of my best friends, Matt, who came with the game, uh, who went to the game with us. He was trying to catch it. He's like six five or six four. So yeah, and you two uh, switched somehow places caught it over. That happened too. Yeah, that is true. Thank <laughs> you, switched places there. But there was a lot of comp for that, and I somehow came up with it. 
But awesome. I love the player fan interaction. It, it's it really is amazing. I've got a bunch of balls myself that are at home that are signed from guys that I've like gone to. My dad and I, our thing is like we try to hit all. We're gonna try and hit all of the ballparks in all of baseball. And you know the big thing for me over all these years has been like trying to get some sort of iconic souvenir at every park you go to. And being a Yankees fan, I hate to say it, but I have to say that Fenway is my favorite park I've ever been to. And, you know, somehow I lost my, lost my Fenway relic. But um, my real question for you now is what's the best ballpark that you played in rotating across all of them at this point? Dude, I would say Fenway. I would say Fenway made made the debut there, bro. I made my debut there. So, like, I got to sign the monster. My wife got to sign the monster. My mom got to sign my dad's name there, dude. That was special. Oh, wow. uh, but, like, dude, just the feel. So, like, the, the seats, man, you know it's the – you're sitting in those seats and you're like, bro, there is a ton of history here. My mom doesn't even know baseball that well. Same with, like, my wife. She'll tell you different, but she really doesn't know it that well. And so it's like <laughs> they're sitting in those. They're sitting in they huge supporters. I'm just saying, like they don't understand the history of like Fenway Park, you know, or like necessarily Wrigley, right? I didn't even, I didn't even, I didn't even understand it really either. But you get Wrigley's like, my dude, number two, by the way. Yeah, dude, the feel, the feel of those two ballparks, bro. Like I'd say the same thing. I think Wrigley's probably my number two. I was and born just, in Chicago, so I've got I that like, filial connection with it, you know. It's dude, it's awesome. Um, it, they protect the feel of of Boston, like they protect the the old time historic feel, especially in the locker room in Boston. And like you go back, like behind the public, right where the media is not, and then it's like all like first class, beautiful type stuff. But like it's got the old time feel in the locker room, bro. It's wild. That's great. It's awesome, Josh. Appreciate I feel that, like man. in New York, living here, like. I love my Yankees. Don't get me wrong, but like, you know, I love the old stadium. That thing was like absolutely historic house at Ruthville. And then same thing when I used to go to Shea, when I was a little kid, Shea was also awesome. They put up two very beautiful, very great stadiums. Um, hopefully there's going to be some better history written in those stadiums to kind of like get, get the ball rolling on that. But, you know, when you're talking about like all the old love stadiums, there's so many that are different that I can think of that have a true like connection to them. Like for example, you know, another one that I think of is like at t park with that huge Coke bottle all the way out in left field. That's like a diner or something like that. And then you've got Camden yards, got the Marriott hotel in right field where balls bounce off the brick building all the time. And like, you know, baseball is one of those sports where it's just truly different. Like I can't, even though football, like I said, is like a huge love of mine, you know, other than like Packers, Lambeau, yeah. Lambeau Field, like I proudly support, you know, the Packers, but um, I don't really think of like all these like absolutely gem minted historic stadiums that like have all these like rich, weird features that like tie in the fans in some cool way. And like, you know, baseball is just different like that. It's like you said, it's got its roots down, it's cemented into past time. And yeah. That's why it's national pastime. America's Very national nice. pastime, for sure, for sure. And Ian, you're you're from you're from Philly, right? Yep. So yep. You're, I was. You're a big uh, Eagles yeah, guy. grew up. Yeah, dude, love, dude, love the Eagles, man. Uh, be honest with you, I've been really trying to get into football as of late. So like, it's dude. I I I wish the Phillies win. I hope the Eagles win. Of course, I'm not a huge like. I don't watch all their games, bro. I, I watch the Eagles games, but I, I haven't really been keeping up too much with the Phillies. Uh, heard Schwarber and, and Harper got hurt, unfortunately. But yeah, dude, I'm always I'm always rooting for the Eagles, bro, for sure. Always rooting for the Phillies. I mean, the Phillies are through. still number one power ranked team in baseball. They're still they're still chugging along, you know, and they've got a good margin of error in between. So they're I would yeah. say they're solid. They're only on Josh, what like twenty eight losses or something like that. Maybe I. It might be. Close it might be 27, right? Yeah, they're not. They got the best record. They're, they're 29. They're 29. Okay. I was going to say, okay. they don't have 30 losses yet. Ian, right. how okay. about any of the other Philly teams? Do you, do you like the Sixers or uh, do you like the Flyers? Dude, I, I don't watch basketball for sure. I don't watch basketball. Always hope the Sixers win. Um, dude, I don't I don't watch too much hockey. But 
of course, like I hope the Flyers win. I've I've been to a couple's flyer like a couple Flyers games, dude. They're electric. That's fair. That's fair. So you you represent like the whole Philly Philly area for sports. I'm all over the place with my teams, and my teams are terrible, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, dude, I'm sorry, man. Yeah. It's all good. Hey, changes every year. You know what I mean. Better luck next year if that's if that's the case, bro. Oh, for sure, for sure. I think I think that's all we got. I think that was a. A great, great, uh, bro. great hour of content right there and just talk baseball talk uh just baseball in general i mean that's that's why baseball is the best sport in the world you can have conversations just like this that's why baseball brings everyone together i mean we just had about an hour of conversation talking about the game we all love i mean <laughs> that says a lot yeah, Ian, just sure. to kind of give you like a little perspective, like a majority of the stuff that Josh and I's families like convene about when we have like holiday gatherings or like Saturday evening meals and stuff like that, we'll straight up go right into the stats. Like <laughs> no holds barred. It's like, hey, how are you? How's the week been? All right, like what's Nico Horner doing now that they're giving the green light to like get around the bases and stuff? Like we're, great, bro. we're digging right in the second that we get that opportunity. And That's I awesome. Feel like for all sports, like, yeah, baseball is that statistical sport. And, you know, Josh, to your dad's credit, really, but you too. Um, I used to really not be a big guy on war until I finally started breaking down what goes into war and why it's so critical and the components. And it was you, Josh, who published a statistic two days ago. That specifically compared Bryce Harper's 2021 MVP season, right, with where Aaron Judge is at now in his current season. And Judge's numbers are even better than an entire season of Harper's MVP voting from years ago. And he's only played, what, 80 games? Yeah, I, I have maybe. Exactly. I mean, war is, war is so important. I mean, look at look at Trout and Miguel Cabrera in 2012. Uh, Cabrera won the triple crown that year. That's why he won the MVP. But Trout's war was two more. I mean, I think that says a lot. And Trout arguably could have won that simply because of war. But Cabrera won that because of the triple crown. So, and Ian, Ian Miller, you're you're positive in war for your career, dude. I, I, you know what? I think I just found that out not too long ago. I think somebody <laughs> told me that. I think I'm a 0.1, dude. Yes, I was just you looking know what? at your stats, yeah. Hey, dude, I'll take it because <laughs> I don't I don't even know what goes into war, bro. I just know, like you said, it's important. And, like, if there's a positive number there, even if it's, like, a if you know, a percent of a number, ah, dude, I'll take it. Josh, I think you break it down for us. Well, I... I think war is the most important stat. It's wins above replacement. I I personally think it's the most. Well, I it's definitely one of the most important stats. With uh, just with baseball, I learned it. Learned a lot more about it in baseball statistics. The class I took in in fall of uh last year. So that was a really cool class and all that. But um, war is huge for calculating stats and how you go about a player. So Ian Miller, you're. You're positive. You're positive, man. You're I'll positive take it. guy right there. I'll take uh, that, bro. For the viewers at home, too, kind of explaining like the novice terms, really, like how you can conceptualize war, just for anybody out there who maybe this is the first time they're hearing about that, because there's defensive war and there's offensive war, kind of both get slammed into the wins above replacement as a whole. So kind of just give a little broad, quick. Yeah, I, I – uh... I probably can't explain it as well as my dad and a few other people, but I mean, war just, it shows you how valuable someone is off on the offensive side and how they are on the defensive side. So there's also another thing called defensive war. So for example, in 2019, when Bellinger won the MVP over Yelich, you look at their hitting stats. Yelich is probably slightly better in the hitting stats, but Bellinger's defensive war was like 20 or something close to that. Plus Damn. 20. I think Yelich was, it wasn't plus 20. And some players can have a negative war. That's like, look at Nolan Arenado, for example. He won 10, uh, 10 straight gold gloves because his defensive war was always positive and it was like two digits. It, was, it, was, it could be 10 plus, 20 plus. I mean, that's how important war is. It shows 
how valuable a player is. I think that is the most important stat. There's more that yeah. goes into it that I, I probably can't explain to you that well, but it, it's a very important stat. And like the base term for everybody at home who's like maybe trying to wonder like what goes into that, I would say to just think of it as like if I were to take that player off that team, there is a pretty standard corollary line between the war st standing that that person has. Let's say it's like Josh is saying double digits. The amount of wins that that team has, they're gone without that player. That person is personally accounting for the wins of the team that that they're they're attributing to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for guys to have double digit war, for example, that is incredibly major. And it means that they're like a ridiculously impact player. No, for sure. yeah, dude. What do you got about what do you got on guys that have a 0 0.1 war? <laughs> positive. It's positive, hey, better than negative. Hey, oh. no. you You're to, better you than the average player. Let's yeah, go, kid. <laughs> You have to put your war over the amount of games that you played too, though. So the fact that you have a positive war and the amount of major league appearances you have is also very standout. Sick, dude. It's a that's ratio. So I love it. Dude, that's awesome. Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I think this is a great, great hour of straight baseball right here for awesome, sure. Brother. And it's been a pleasure to uh really really meet you in the last six months and see what you're doing with the nine hole, uh, your MLB and baseball experience. So it, it's been a pleasure to learn that it was great to meet you about a month ago. So, I mean, I really appreciate you and, uh, big things coming for both of us. Hey man, boys, I, I appreciate the time dude. Thank you for having me here. Um, if there's anything I can do for either one of you guys, uh, like in any facet of this, hit me up, let me know. Um, shoot me over if if you don't mind when you guys are ready. Shoot me this over. I'll see what my team can like put together for us. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to use any of this without uh, both of your approval. Um, hit me up if you need me for anything, dude. I'm around. Thank you, boys, for the time. No, Absolutely. thank you. Thank you. Absolutely, guys. I'll catch you guys. All right. Take care, Ian. See ya. Thank see you. See you, fellas. Thank you, boys.